This show comes to us from the Vitro Museum, which is uh, in Germany, but just outside Basel, Switzerland, Switzerland, so right at the border of Germany and Switzerland. And the Vitro Museum collects design objects and <coughs> materials and ephemera. It uh, was exhibited at two other institutions in Europe, in Denmark and Sweden. And really, um, and also at the MCA Chicago, we're the only venue in the West Coast of the US. Um, and the show really, I and mean, the title is a good place to start because it really is about pop art and design. And so when we say design, what, are, what right away the first kind of thing I think to get into is what are we talking about? When we talk about art, we know we're assuming paintings, maybe prints, sculptures, there's some sculptures in this in this show as well. But, but design, what does design mean? What commercial mean? So it has to do with commerce? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Functional. Yeah. Functional. So maybe furniture or objects we might use. Advertising, graphic design. Um, all of those things are, are part of this exhibition. And, and one of the things that I think is really key is this um, equal treatment of all of these kinds of materials. So this idea that art and design are considered um, on the same level playing field. And that was really an important tenet of pop art in general. That was really the goal. And this was the moment when artists like Andy Warhol uh, were really kind of subverting those typical hierarchies, or maybe old-fashioned at this point hierarchies of high art with the elevated kind of celebrated artist as this authoritarian um, figure. This was the moment when all of that, and, and in society too, when all kinds of power structures were being upended. And so all of those things relate and connect and weave their way into the exhibition in a really fun way. So we'll go ahead and go inside and, and talk more about these things as, as, as we go along. But I think it's a good, there are lots of good ways to get into that. And I'm sure you all have lots of insight and memories and ideas about the, the time period that people offer. I don't know where it was between Old Harvard and the museum. Oh, wait. No, it's been the Beach Road Museum. Oh, thank you. As I mentioned, we are the fifth venue for this exhibition. And so, over time, these groupings have evolved shifted a little bit. I, I'd like to think of them as kind of suggestions of umbrellas, ways for us to um, um, understand some connections between the works, but don't hold on to them too tightly. Because mm -hmm. if you if you look, if you press on them, they they they, they might become a little bit confusing. But and I think that also so many of these objects could be reorganized. I mean you could all be curated the show, I'm sure, in really interesting ways and find all kinds of other relationships between the objects that are not necessarily the way they're presented here. So this is just one way of, of grouping and orienting the series of works. The other thing I wanted to say about this show is it um, includes um, objects from the Vitro Museum collections, uh, loans from individuals and other institutions, um, both in Europe and in the United States, as well as works from our own collection. So it's really a wonderful opportunity for us as an institution to be able to showcase some real probably that many of you are already really familiar with and have spent time thinking about and getting to know already. So um, this is a really lovely little starting point, I will say, because it really encapsulates those things that I was talking about uh, before, that sort of mix of high and low and the everyday with the fine art. We have just a, a it, it is what it is, a Coca-Cola vending machine, I think, from what is it, 1967? Um, this was from 47, sorry. So really early. So and this show I would say um, spans most of the, sh the, the works are from the 60s up until the late 70s, maybe early 80s. But so this is a, a you know this sort of brand of Coca-Cola that's already in the sort of popular imagination at this time. Would then you get to us when you get when you say it started by the Well this one I think is the earliest object in the show, but most of the works are from the 60s. That's what I thought. Um, kind of, I mean, Todd's goal with this exhibition on the heels of American Mosaic is to pick up kind of when that historical moment of the 60s and abstract expressionism left off, this is sort of picking up from that moment and moving a sort of march of history, moving chronologically forward. Um, but this grouping, I think, is really wonderful because it, it, it kind of encapsulated, encapsulates what 
the exhibition is trying to do on a larger level. So you have this, this functional object, right, a vending machine, with the brand, and then you have the Andy Warhol print. From it, this one is from 1967. This iconic, classic, camel suit here. Then you have this Italian de uh, design of a little stool based on the Andy Warhol print. So this piece was not made, it was made within a couple of years after Warhol's prints had became so recognized on an international level, you have an artist in Italy who's already playing with the form and, and in this very kind of humorous and um, kind of an extension, I would say, in many ways of what Warhol was even doing himself, right? Taking this idea, this, this image of something, this familiar, commodified, everyday grocery store item, and it can morph and change into all different kinds of um, Material. So this is an Andy Warhol design piece. Um, he called it the super dress. And I love actually if you look closely, you can read the label. It starts out saying, no cleaning, no washing, it's carefree. <laughs> 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 and in the way it says, it says carefree, like all one word, not carefree. <laughs> Which is cute. Um, anyway, so I think it's a nice introductory moment here to get into the show, get into the, some of the big important themes of, of, of pop art. And I, I trust that we can keep talking about what those are, but we don't have to go too much into it. What do you say to the adult that says, how can I call this art? I guess we just say, well, let me turn it to you. What would you say? I don't know what I would say. <laughs> Does that help answer the question? 
there's the big sparks of conversation. It's amazing, yeah, and there's yeah. so much. This is such a big Why is it so good? Why is it So many things. Is this in the same room? Yeah. Right, right now we're right here. Yes. Oh. And is that the same room? Yeah. Yeah. That is? Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know where you're asking. Where were it sent to? That was where the Uh, maybe they had really good balance. I don't know. <laughs> the other thing that's important to remember um, is that so many of these new ways of thinking about furniture and combining materials really had to do with technological innovations that were happening. So in this room, you start to see uh, uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of plastic forms. The idea of another, these iconic Charles and Ray chairs that plastic could be molded and melded into these kind of organic or flowing forms. So in this section we have, or this group, we have two kind of thematic or groupings, actually three. Uh, one about reproduction, repetition, and pattern. So you can see um, this over here is a piece by, I think it's, uh, oh my gosh, what do you think? Um, Alexander Gerard, and there's a number of Alexander Gerard. Um, it was a graphic designer that we'll see a lot, a lot of in the exhibition, but this idea of the repeated pattern and shifts of color. Um, and also how that relates to, as I was saying, these um, new techniques with chairs, but even if you look at the way the forms are repeated and lines and the combination of the same form being repeated in different colors, right? So all those things are, are become part of the kind of aesthetic, the, the look of the time. Uh, another wonderful feature um, in this in this room is the shop window. It's this tromboy effect. This is this is sort of the era of Mad Men, right? So I this, I always think of that. Right? I mean, this, this mural in the background. Um, this moment when the idea, the sort of self consciousness of of how things are designed and sold to us for the purpose or a design. of experimental forms and colors or this chair that takes you in the shape of the body. This is an amazing room to even have, start to have a conversation about how the form of the chair is evolving, if you think of it. I mean, it's kind of basic, but there are some uh, fantastic examples in here. Uh, the other part of the gallery of color is looking at the ideas about surface. So we have these various kind of slick plastic surfaces as well as um, Know well the um, pink pearl eraser that is actually made of balsa wood, but um, we have someone who's quoted talking about how she wants you to remember that the texture and even the smell and the feel of that eraser from your you know grade school desk, um, as well as the Klaus Oldenburg uh, piece of cake, uh, which is made of plaster, but even gives you that that sense of uh, you know. Um, yeah. Sorry, you might have mentioned that earlier, but why is it behind glass? The, the so, to give you, it's, a, it's kind of a, um, it's, it, it's supposed to be a shop, like a hinting at a shop window, like in a big department store in New York. 
and, and it, it's a way of, of really emphasizing this consciousness of um, uh, display and, and the consumerism of these things and how not only were um, these objects for sale, but it kind of like a whole lifestyle was being promoted. Uh, and we'll see a lot more of that. Um, on the far wall, there are some more examples of that, um, the shop window. And in this corner, uh, in this section, the, there uh, is the, the theme, Thinking Automatons, is the, is the title. So it, uh, it's really focusing on the rise of science fiction. Uh, we have the Forbidden Planet poster, which I think is a wonderful way to start the conversation. Apparently, I learned this recently, the movie, The Forbidden Planet, was the first time uh, an unidentified flying object is represented in a film. <laughs> so that's, kind of, that's why they included it in the exhibition. And the, all these images, these ideas about robots and, and, and this tension that started to come into the culture about technology. So both a fascination with it as well as a little bit of anxiety, right? This is the Cold War period. This is the moment of like the threat of nuclear war and all of those things that sort of seep their way into sci the science fiction narrative. Uh, this, is, uh, this video is also a, a child's brain piece. I, I encourage you to spend some time with it. It's about, it has to do with communication and technology. Um, I think it's lovely and really telling and, and uh, Edie and I were just talking about how there are so many ways that actually as, you know, uh, probably children won't have, be able to make these references to the historical period, have the same kind of memories about the culture, but there are a lot of things, particularly, I think, with dealing with technology that I think will be interesting for them to compare to the way we think about technology and communication today, and this is a fun look at that. Here's another example of an object from our collection, a Dwayne Valentine spinning top. Some people often think of it as, as an, a UFO, so you can kind of make that connection. This is a kind of a nice moment um, to really showcase some strong works from our collection in this gallery. The Warhol Mows, as I mentioned before. Um, they're included in this gallery uh, as a comparison to the images in this light box over here. There's a wonderful image. Uh, in every iteration, it has 
had to adapt to the space. Okay. And and we were and so at the MCA Chicago, there were more things from their collection that were featured, and we were able to borrow a handful of objects from Chicago, uh, but also then supplement things that didn't come, you know, from the other institutions uh, with works that we had in our and collection. Did you lend it, we didn't. No, okay. we didn't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, Alexander Girard, um, I mentioned what was a graphic designer. Um, Kind of um, fabulous fabric designer and fabric designer. Yeah, so the fabric samples are in the other room. There are shopping bags. There are uh, ceramic pieces. This wall has a wonderful selection of photographs, actually taken by Charles Eames. Um, many in Gerard's home in Santa Fe. Um, I have, yeah, it's wonderful just to take some time and look. I don't know how how easy they'll be to work with a large group, but just for your own interest and information, I think. Lovely. If anybody gets to Santa Fe, Alexander Gerard donated his miniatures, which are voluminous, to the museum, blah, 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 the museum folk one. art museum, folk art. I think it is. It's in the museum square. And it takes up a huge, huge. room. Yeah. with a variety of settings. And if you haven't seen it and you get to Santa Fe, that's a real must. Yeah, so there, this, this, I mean, he, he really developed a signature style that's easily identifiable, this, this um, kind of playful, uh, they call it folk art, but there's a kind of childlike quality, I think, to the line and the form. Um, these are sugar packets, and I think chocolate candy wrappers. <laughs> and um, these are not, uh, I guess these are, no, these are not Gerard, I don't think. They're just an example of matchbooks, though, but I think sharing some similar sensibilities. Hmm. We can move on to the next gallery. I'll, I'll sneak out and let you guys file in and look. <laughs> there is a lot to cover. I'm going Oh, hooray, this moved. Does anyone have any questions? I hope I'm not going too fast. You'll have time to soak it up. Showcases that as well. Uh, again, this is this, this 
is an era where we have plastics, 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 right? <laughs> um, so really embracing that synthetic kind of um, industrial production, those methods, that kind of sci-fi aesthetic, and also that sense of a little encapsulated world. Um, there's some wonderful images of some architecture too that embrace that <laughs> quality. <laughs> yes, it's a cool strange little pod home. Yeah. That used to be Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember going in there. Me too. One of them is commissioned by Monsanto, I noticed. It was Monsanto and MIT. It's in Tomorrowland. So it brings, and it brings together the House of the Future industry production, all of these things, the relationship between science and technology and innovation and the way that that influenced all aspects of daily life. And really this notion of the way that's living in this kind of futuristic society and how that was really embraced at the time. Um, the other part of this gallery. Huh? It's a tiny house. Um, These are, but that was the big one. The big one. Retitled it because I think it was like drugs and consumption, and <laughs> it was like really pro drugs the way they had written the label. So we kind of shifted the way of framing it. But thinking about this, you know, I think there was a thing had written about uh, media being the opiate of the masses, with this, you know, typical '60s theme of uh, turn on, tune in, drop out, and uh, the idea that you know maybe. All the, you can take this fantasy of this giant Klaus Oldenburg pill and all of the, you know, problems and challenges of the, of the world would disappear. But, and then, you know, and I think there's a humorous sense of, you know, I don't know, if you want some pill lamps in your house. Is it, is it titled Mother's Little Helper? <laughs> <laughs> All of those things um, also play into this cultural moment. I think it's more than psychedelic, though. I think it's a commentary also on like the nature of perception and the magic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I know. that the word honk can maybe evoke a feeling or a thought, you think about the sounds of what that, um, that word evokes and how he's playing with that uh, sort of imaginary quality through the way he's presenting the form of the letters. Um, Annie is also, I think, more, again, thinking about the kind of iconography, the branding of the Little Orphan Annie comic book. And this was made before, you know, the movie of the year. So really oh, yeah. looking back at the original um, comic book for reference. Um, and then we're moving here more into the sort of design realm. So kind of, again, kind of seamlessly flowing back and forth between what we might consider, you know, a fine art object and a design-based object. Um, just some examples of, you know, this designer, um, Anderson from... Oh, yes. Yeah. This is Gerard. Gerard. Yeah. Anyway. Um, this gallery is a combination of This was a tricky one for us to kind of rationalize, but I think we, we found a way to think about playful perspective. And again, this sense of really experimenting with an object's scale and material quality. Uh, this foot was initially inspired from uh, like an ancient Roman ruin, oh, yeah. as you know. But if you look closely, it's made of polyurethane foam. Okay. And it's actually meant to be um, a 
lounge chair. <laughs> there are a couple of these polyurethane pieces that I know are very tempting to touch, by the way, but they're among the most fragile objects in the exhibition, so we have to be extra careful. Even though they're plastic, they're actually, um, you can see that they're all kind of cracking and, and, quite, and quite fragile. Um, but again, this sense of scale, this shift in perspective, is sort of opening up our, our way of traditional ways of seeing things and, and treating material um, with this playful point of view um, that has its roots in um, maybe comics and graphic arts of the time um, as well. The other, uh, this series of works comes to us from the FCA San Diego, and even though it's in this gallery, I think it goes better with the next group, which has to do with the dissolution of images. Um, this, I mean, Lichtenstein being really a, a forerunner of that, this idea of really playing with it, the printing process, the bending dots, this idea of something as, as repeated and over time, and, and even thinking about media culture, and that's, again, this way that we might be able to connect to our, our contemporary moment, this sort of saturation, this is really the, with the influx of advertising and commercials and television and all of that, this was the time when we started to really become aware of how our culture is really, really became inundated, inundated with um, images of, of media and how that sort of mass production and reproduction of imagery, um, artists were starting to think critically about the effect that that may have on us as viewers. Exactly, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. It's a beautiful series, yeah, yeah. I'm excited yeah. that we have it. There's another really wonderful moment, I would say, as far as a teaching moment in this concept, um, another like consent piece, and also a china set. Which yes. else was another favorite object of mine. I, I wouldn't mind having a dinner party and, and serving everyone on this little china set. <laughs> a lot of fun. I don't know how food it. would look on it. But it's you have to be very careful, I think. <laughs> very selective. Oh, the chair. And this iconic design image throughout the marshmallow chair. Um, also in this section, and inspired by these ideas of the the idea of the Vendée got the printing process, the separation of colors uh, expanded. So uh, it's actually not a terrible transition from the one gallery to the next. This idea of something being blown up to such a scale that uh, that we even shift our perspective on how it how it can function in the world. That the Vendée got can be blown up to something that you could sit on. Um, <laughs> Which is not entirely unlike this is another another favorite object of mine. Patone. Patone means large grass in Italian. Um, this section is called Living Outdoors and references also this moment of really sort of this sort of uh, bringing the indoor and outdoor together, uh, questioning pub, private and public life, and how particularly I think in places like Southern California that became so much a part of the lifestyle, so much so emblematic of the way uh, design and life kind of came together. So, uh, and also again, this playfulness with scale and what we could think of as furniture. This object is intended to uh, was intended as a as a coat rack. <laughs> so you could play with that. Like, what could you use, what could you possibly use this for in your house? I don't know that kids would even know what a coat rack. My kids probably would know what a coat rack is, but. Uh, <laughs> And this is a lounge That's chair meant to go outside, maybe by the pool after you, you know, on a sunny afternoon. Out of curiosity, does this is appealing to anyone to, to it's lay down in there? No. Yes. No? Oh my god, I want to lay so bad. Yes? I agree. I think it's funny. It's like I think it's the same way people feel about being bad. You either love being Yeah. 
is this supposed to be flexible? In other words, so somebody could sit in there and the things would move. Exactly. And this is again one of the more fragile objects in the exhibition. If you look closely, you can so see no how it's right. right. yes. 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 The conservator from the major museum came in. She said, actually, they're still producing these today. And she went to a design show in my in Milan, and they invited her to go sit down, and she like didn't know what to do. No. <laughs> she said it was actually really comfortable, but uh, yeah. This one I feel like works amazing. The other piece in this room is the Andy Warhol wallpaper. It goes with this disillusion of the images section, which there's some other works here also that deal with that question. The idea of things, again, um, sort of mass production of images, but, uh, things becoming uh, almost sort of the idea that something might lose its power once it's reproduced over and over and over again so many um, times. The idea of a sort of mundane quality of restitution. Um, in, in the mass production of the country. We have another little kind of nook in here. Yeah. Well, these are, um, this installation that, that's like a cube, and in another room it's a maroon cube. Uh -huh. Are they, was this uh, devised in Chicago or in Germany? Actually, or here? yeah, at Bartich, uh, um, it's part of their, their design of the exhibition. And so, um, yeah, so we have to find a way to design it into our floor plan and layout of the show. But yeah, it's part that it came to us with the show. The, the, the sort of big elements that came to us as sort of um, already like designed, as far as the exhibition go, are the, the, the purple and blue little huts, as well as the glass uh, shop window. So here we have, uh, this section is called Everyday Life Made Public. So looking really, it's about street, the street, street scenes you're welcome to come in. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the, our Ed Roche, every building on the Sunset Strip. Uh, where Ed Roche photographed every building on the Sunset Strip. I think it's, uh, what is the year, 66? Um, yeah, 66. Um, this, and he made it into a book. Um, another really wonderful thing for, I mean, as someone who is always interested in, in the history of architecture, and, um, this project by Robert Venturi and Denise Capron, uh, which they did uh, in from 68 to 71, was really, it's a really, there was a, there was a, there was a book about it, and, and this concept, they were really fascinated by studying the way buildings and signage and the relationship between signage and bu buildings and how that was really evolving at the time. Um, and it started with this building that that's, shaped like a duck. And so they, they said, in their mind, there were two different kinds of buildings. There was a, there was a dock building, which the, in which the building looked like the thing that it was, like a casino, or, you know, Tail of Puff Donuts, or the, the do I mean, sorry, hot dog, the donut, donut, donut shop. Um, or there was the, the shed. And the shed was really what it was. It was a functional building, and, and, and it needed a sign to tell you what was actually going on inside the building. And so what starts to happen at this, at this particular time is that easily discernible sort of separation between those buildings falls away. And you have signage that starts to look like the form of the, the feathers, and um, like the flamingo feathers, or stardust, that, where the sign itself takes the form of the thing that it might be representing. And particularly in Las Vegas, that was sort of emblematic of that. Um, there's another uh, Charles and Ray Ames Video film here as well. Oh, goodness. <laughs> this one's live. Yeah. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. I just like the. Did we do some of the new pieces to this exhibit when it was out of places? We didn't actually. Because I think we kind of joined the tour later once it was already because Todd was able to Todd saw the show in Chicago and then he was able to get them to extend it to come to us afterwards. Um, so this section um, is called Everyday Heroes. So looking at really mundane household objects like a plug or a tea bag or a zipper. And this again this sense of playful scale and, and what that shift in scale can do in that sort of experimental quality of you know how you could turn a little a plug into a lamp. 
Yeah. Will we be bringing children through? No, no. No, 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 no I just said that. So uh, we can, you probably will want to take the school groups around the other way. Yeah. I think if it's not that it's not on the map. The yeah. the loop sofa is such a classic. It's it too is. bad that it's not somewhere. Yeah, I mean. I think there are enough other yeah. iconic classic yeah. subjects. The last section deals with um, what we've called the ruin as pop. So even looking at, by this point, architecture has really taken this turn towards sleek, modernist, kind of minimal forms. Um, and so things like, you know, prints or, uh, you know, ancient, uh, relics were treated with this sort of playful pop sensibility. This is also a chair. <laughs> and that's a lamp. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work, so uh, I'm sort of so... I, I kind of, if it had a cord, maybe it would be more clear that it's a lamp. Yeah. But it is a functional object. It's not just a sculpture. If you look closely, you can see it, it has a kind of um, hard plastic exterior. Or so today with your hair. <laughs> yeah, I could be, I guess, hang your coat on her head, yeah? <laughs> Thank you. 